Hi everyone, this is Ivan from Skills Build Training. This channel is all about showing you how to become a highly paid IT pro fast. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to set up a network intrusion detection system and send the logs to Elastic. Thank you for choosing to watch. To help us help more people like you, please like, comment, and subscribe. Also, hit the notification bell so you'll get notified of our future videos. So let's get started. One of the most important aspects of security is monitoring network traffic. The best way to accomplish this is to tap the traffic with an intrusion detection system. In today's video, we're going to set up an IDS that utilizes both Sericata and Zeek to provide the data needed to perform detection and threat hunting of the network activity. Endpoint monitoring is important, but never underestimate the value of solid network traffic analysis. The first piece of software we're using in our IDS is called Sericata. It's an intrusion detection system all by itself. It performs deep packet inspection using rules and signatures. It's capable of operating both as an IDS, meaning quietly tapping the traffic, and as an intrusion prevention system, which means that it can actually drop connections based on those same rules and um, signatures. It, um, the rule format is actually the same as an IDS, um, very famous IDS known as Snort. So what's nice about this is it means the community can use the same rules on either IDS system. It's application layer aware. This is something very um, specific to Sericata out of the box. What that means is, is that it can tell what protocol is being used. It knows HTTP is different from F. TP from SSH, and this means that it can actually be used for more than just deep packet inspection. It can be used to profile what type of traffic your your um, your business or environment might have. So if you want to know more than just the security, but maybe also usage stats, or you have a particular type of traffic that you're trying to keep out just for other reasons than security, Sericata can handle that. Um, finally, it has really high performance because um, again, out of the box, it's multi-threaded for performance. So that means, you know, if on your processor and such, it can be pretty heavy to be doing this deep packet inspection. Well, Sericata right away can start using your different um, cores, different threads. So it's, it's very performant. The next piece of software that we're going to be putting on our IDS is called Zeek. It's a network security monitoring um, package. It provides extensive logging of network traffic. Um, for almost any protocol, it can be can be parsed into very useful metadata. This is what makes it so good for um, threat hunting, which actually I have as um, on the bottom point, because not only do you get you know the information about what rules or such might have been triggered, but you also get all that information about you know what was being done with the protocol where did it come from where was it going a lot of useful metadata that can be signs of different tactics or techniques being used by adversaries now zeke itself is actually very powerful um, it has its own scripting language for internal data transformation you can also program custom plugins so if there's a protocol that you might use that isn't covered then you can actually program an entire uh, plugin that parses that protocol. So Zeek is extremely powerful, extremely customizable, and there's a really big community out there uh, who will help you out when you're not quite sure how something works or you want to learn something beyond, you know, just what's in the documentation. So Zeek is a very powerful program that way. The next part that we're going to be putting in it's the it's the final of the three that are actually going to go on the server it's um we're going to be using filebeat but filebeat is actually part of a larger family of just beats um they're lightweight data shippers uh they are small agents written in go so golang the neat thing about beats is they can take a lot of different types of inputs actually um with ours we're using filebeat to bring in logs but in reality beats can take input from Kafka servers. So if you have a larger messaging queue going on, Redis, uh, they can take inputs from Azure event hubs. 
you can have uh, TCP connections going right into the beat if you need it to, syslog, all sorts of different inputs. You also have a multitude of outputs. However, um, the best, obviously, in my opinion, is the fact that they can go straight to Elasticsearch, so no in-betweens. One of the newest features of Beats is the modules that Elastic has been adding. It makes it a lot easier to configure and set things up. There's a lot of pre-built modules. We're actually going to be using two of them. So we're not going to have to mess with pipelines. We're not going to have to mess with configurations or any of that. It's, it's all going to be under the hood, which is wonderful. And this is the this is what's really done it is um, ingest pipelines. This is where all the data transformation is happening when it gets to Elasticsearch itself. It's going through the ingest node, but the data can actually be transformed there. Uh, previously, this used to be a job for Logstash, but nowadays you can just take the beat, input the data, point it at Elastic, and the job gets done. So this is why beats are really taking a dominating role. Um, in my opinion, overshadowing Logstash altogether. Okay, so before we start building our ideas here, I wanted to go over some of the theory on how a network intrusion detection system is integrated into a network. Uh, so I got this diagram, just to give um, credit, I got it off of sciencedirect.com, and they, they have a wonderful set of topics on computer science. I chose this one because it's pretty simple. Um, I also like how it has the internet is like the dark, scary place, so it's a dark cloud. And then the trusted network is, you know, your happy, white, poofy clouds. I thought that was cool. So you have your firewall in, you know, general perimeter. And then you have the traffic, though, inside of the trusted network. So this is what I wanted to get across with this diagram, is we're tapping the traffic that is already gone through the firewall, it's already into the router, so you're going to have, um, you know, private, you're going to have your private IP ranges, and you're going to be tapping this silently, okay? So notice that the NIDS, the Network Intrusion Detection System, it's read-only. So that little line there is going to it, and that's going to be quiet. You don't want people to know, um, you know, what where that's connected, how it's reading off, because you don't want to tip off an adversary that there's um, network tapping going on, especially, let's say, if you're in an incident response situation where there might have already been a breach, you definitely don't want them to start targeting, um, you know, the defenders. That would be very bad. It can happen, but you want to avoid it. So that's why you make sure um, that you don't do things like make it obvious where the network tap is. Um, for In particular, on our setup, the interface we'll be using, the network interface won't even have an IP. Um, it'll just take information in, but it won't, you know, it won't show up on ARP tables or anything like that. And then, of course, it needs to be connected to your management system. And we'll go into that. Um, it's the reason why the server has to have two interfaces. Um, you know, one to tap the traffic and then one co to connect to a management network of some sort. In our case, it's also going to be sending logs through that same um, interface. So without further to do, um, that goes over the basics on how it's set up. If you have any questions, of course, you can throw them in the comments, but we're going to go ahead and get started. For this project, I'm using a Oracle VirtualBox um, machine. So you could use something like VMware if you're more comfortable with that. I just prefer VirtualBox, but the settings and such should all be pretty much um, the same. And what I did was I created a new machine and I'll go ahead and go over the settings that I used. Um, first of all, I gave mine eight gigabytes of RAM you don't have to give it that much. I wouldn't give it much less than four though. So, you know, that's just my recommendation. Um, if you have, if you can, like my machine here has a total of 16, so I gave it eight. If you can give it eight, go for it. Processor, I actually should have had this up to two, so we'll put that up to two cores. Okay, we're not gonna have to worry about display because we're using a server so we're just gonna have the um, we're just gonna have the terminal to deal with 
storage, I created a virtual hard drive just for this project. Um, I put it at about 80 gigabytes. We're probably never going to use that much, but if you click dynamically allocate it, it just means it'll use as much as it needs. It won't use the whole 80, which is nice. I just give it that much in case, you know, I want to play with this thing longer and I need more room for logs. Here's the most important setting that I wanted to get it to um, are the network adapters. So on my first network adapter, I have it bridged. Okay. And then it has, um, it's bridged through my Wi-Fi because that's how I'm connected to the internet. So you're going to want to have it bridged because we're going to be using, um, what's it called? We're going to be using SSH to get into it. I'm going to be using PuTTY for that. And so you want to be able to reach it, you know, versus having it NAT it. And then you're going to need a second adapter. So if you're not used to this, make sure that you enable the second adapter. And then what I like to do when I'm setting up the IDS is I like to put it on host only so that it's just sitting there, you know, on a network that's not being used. But this way it can be activated and it knows it's working and all that wonderful stuff. And this is the other important step. See where it says promiscuous mode? Make sure allow all is chosen. There's deny, allow VMs. So if you just wanted to keep it within VMs, I always put allow all because one of the funnest things to do with an IDS is later on, hook it up so that it's reading all your network traffic that you're really using back and forth with the internet. So, you know, you want to put allow all in case you want to do that at some point. And I believe that's it as far as what you need to know. Now, before the video, I did go ahead and install my Ubuntu um, server ISO and um, I did the whole, you know, app update, app upgrade. So it's all ready to go. So we'll get started with that now that I've gone through the important settings. <clears throat> okay, I have my virtual machine on now and I'm not going to work directly in this um, terminal because there's a couple reasons. The biggest one is I can't copy paste. Now, I guess theoretically you could put guest editions on and that would let you copy paste. But in reality, if you think about it, if you're on a server, you wouldn't have it plugged into a monitor anyways. So that's why I don't, it, it's also kind of weird to use it that way. So what I do is I just turn it on and then I make note of what the IP address is. In this case, it's um, my .1.109. So then I minimize that. Now I'm using PuTTY um, as my SSH client. I've gotten used to doing that. It's a pretty nice one. Lets you manage keys and all that stuff if you're using um, you know, SSH keys instead of passwords. I think now you can actually use OpenSSH just like you would on a Linux machine on Windows, but I don't have that set up right now. So I'm just gonna use this. So all I'm gonna do for those of you who may not have done this or don't do it all the time, just enter. It's already going to port 22. By default, it's set to SSH. It's going to ask me, do I really want to trust this thing? I'm going to say yes. And then I can log in. OK. So there we are, we're logged in. And again, if you haven't done so, I already did it, but I'll do it again. Make sure the first thing you will always do is run your update <coughs> commands because you want to make sure that there's all the updates have been done. Oh, look, there's even some I can do now. So this was good to do. Few, few more since the last time I set this up. Okay, so yeah, always make sure you do that. Okay, so once you got that all updated, go ahead and clear so that you have a clean terminal. And then I want you, we're going to use IP address here. And what we're gonna do is we need to make sure we know the name of the interfaces that we're using. Now notice that for me, ENP0, 
S117, or an easy way of thinking about it, E posy 17 is my main management interface. Um, it's management interface because this is the one that I am connecting to through the internet. Okay, this is the one that has a has an IP address. This is the one that I'm going to be connecting to to set up the IDS and manage it over time. And this is also the interface that the logs are going to be sent from that are going to be going to Elastic. Now, this interface here is right now is down because it doesn't have any um, setup. But you're going to want to make sure you remember its name because we're going to need that for configuration. So on me, it's ENP0S8, or as I like to say, ENPOSY8. So you're going to want to probably write that down somewhere just to make sure you know. So, so you know which one's your management and which one's what we call your sniffing interface. Okay. So the first thing that you should know is Ubuntu has started using a network manager called NetPlan, and it's actually very good um, for standard networking needs, setting everything up, configuring it. However, it doesn't yet support setting up an interface in promiscuous mode. So we're actually going to be putting in uh, the older version of the network manager, um, more similar to what Debian uses, and then we're going to be uninstalling NetPlan. Um, as a service because we're not going to be using it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to install those older um, network tools that will allow us to set up the promiscuous mode. So I'm going to actually be copying and pasting most of my commands from a wonderful little article that I wrote on setting this up. We'll make this available to you. Um, so that you have this. So the first one here does that, but I'll also be putting them in on the terminal as well, so you're following along. So the command is um, sudo apt install uh, the hyphen y for yes, obviously. And the the tool set we're setting up though is called if up down. So I'm going to push enter on that and let that install. Okay, so now we have those tools um, ready to be used. The next step we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating a configuration file. So we're going to go ahead and use our nano editor, and we're going to do sudo nano. And then we're going to put it in etc slash network slash interfaces. And we can go ahead and put this under this um, source directory here. This is what I'm saying. We'll probably we'll make this available for you, because what it does is it sets up our loop back, um, then it sets up the management interface with uh, DHCP, but then it gets our promiscuous interface all set up. So I'll copy the the text in, and then I'll go over it, what it's all doing. Okay. So our loop back is obviously our loopback. Management, we have this, um, the interface is gonna be set up, DHCP. Now, in a real production environment, you would probably um, set this up as a static IP address, because you know it's a running server, you want it to be at the same place all the time. Or the other option, which is what I tend to do, is um, make a, um, a Mac reservation in your DHCP server. So, you know, whatever you're using for that, um, whether it's your main router or if you have a separate DHCP server, make a reservation. That's another easier way, really, to set it up. 
Then we have our sniffing interface. This is the one that gets tricky. So same start, allow hot plug. Um, this is why I was saying to write these down because notice your management interface, you want that name up here. And then your sniffing interface, you want that, you know, you want that one here. So I put the name of it, ENP0S8, then the interface, in um, my interface name, INET, INET, it's going to be manual because we're manually telling it what to do. Then you're going to put in the command up if config. Here's the important part, promisc up. So we want promisc in there. That's what's going to put it in promiscuous mode. Then you got to put in the line down if config. So, you know, when it goes down, it's also in promisc. So that's the um, configuration for the network interfaces. I'll leave it up a little longer, but of course you can pause the video and um, just write it down. We'll also make that article available to you. Okay, so I'm going to save that. And it's ready to go. Okay, so make sure to clear your terminal um, with the clear command because you don't want it to get too cluttered. Let me get my mouse out of the way there. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to be shutting down the network services and then we're just going to make sure that NetPlan isn't still installed. So sudo service systemd network d stop okay so that's stopped now on some versions of ubuntu netplan will be installed on others i don't think it is so just in case it is we're going to do a sudo app remove netplan yes okay so see this one was saying that netplan wasn't installed so that's a good thing in our from our perspective. But just in case it was installed on your system, go ahead and make sure to do that command. Now, I do like having net tools installed. I'm just che double checking that there's a hyphen there. I do like having net tools. So I'm going to go ahead and do sudo apt install yes on net tools. They're, they're convenient. Net tools, if you're not familiar, it's just the um, like the if config. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna reboot our we're gonna go ahead and reboot our virtual machine. Now you could actually just stop and start the interfaces and that should reset everything, but just for good measure, I always like rebooting the whole thing. So you can see I lose my SSH connection because obviously it's rebooting. So let's go ahead and look at the virtual machine and you can see that it's rebooting. Okay, so it's rebooted. Now, I'm going to go ahead and SSH again. I'm going to have to close this. I'm going to go ahead and use PuTTY to SSH into it again. Okay. Now, if we do IP address, you should now see a difference on your sniffer. And on mine, it is there, so I'm very happy. The big difference is now it says up. Notice that, so it's turned on. But the most important thing is it says promisc. Because that means that promiscuous mode is turned on 
And what promiscuous mode means, by the way, is it means that it will receive the network packets that are addressed to any of the IP addresses on the network. So not just the ones that are specifically for this device, for the server in this case, but all of them. Because remember, usually you only get the ones associated with your IP, with your MAC address. But when you're in promiscuous mode, that's, that doesn't apply. You get everybody's, and that's what we want. Okay, so at this point, this is what I suggest everybody do, and I'm going to do it is I'm actually going to make a snapshot of my virtual machine. And the reason I like to do this is it sets me up for little points where if something goes wrong, I can go back and redo it without having to lose you know, a lot of progress or without things getting too messy. Notice that when I set up my VM, I actually took one and it's called Ubuntu Server Clean. Um, I always do that. I, it's always my starting point. Once I set it up and I do the up, update and upgrade, then I take a snapshot so I can go back in case something goes wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this one a nice little name. And I'm going to put promiscuous, actually I'm just going to call it promisc, promisc setup. Working. Usually you can put a, a description, but I like to give just a name that's pretty pretty solid. Doesn't take long, but believe me, it will save you a lot of headache in the future. So the next step that we're going to do is now we're going to install Sercata, the um, signature-based IDS. So the way we're going to do this is we're actually going to use the um, Ubuntu repository that Sercata has for their stable branch, which is very convenient because it means we don't have to build it from source. So your first command is going to be to add that particular repository. Well, first the commons that it's actually in. Then add the specific Sericata stable branch. Okay, I'm going to push enter when it prompts me to, because it's going to say, do you really want to do this? Okay, it's all at it. I'm going to go ahead and clear my screen, because that's a lot of stuff to have on it. Once you do that, actually, it's pretty easy at that point. We're not even going to use copy-paste. Once you do that, you just have to update your repositories so they include the new ones. Then once you have that accomplished, you can install Sercata. And it is nicely installed. Much easier than having to build it from source and worry about files are and everything like that. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start um, we are going to start configuring our Sericata. So the file location that we're going to use, I'll show it to you in a sec here, is sudo nano, and then it's going to be slash etc slash Sericata slash Sericata dot yaml. I'm going to enter. Now, what I like to do first is replace any um, of the references to the old sniffer interface because by default it has um, the original interface put in there but we want to replace it with the one that we're actually using so what we want to do is hold down shift and push um, backslash and then we're going to search for eth0 and in my case, since this is my sniffer interface, I'm going to replace it with ENPS8. Now remember, you want to make sure to put in whatever sniffing interface that you um, wrote down the name of earlier. So I'm going to replace it there. 
Hold on, I didn't do it. Replace it there. There. That's technically a comment, but I just push yes anyways because I like to just do all of them, so make sure I don't miss one. Okay, replace nine occurrences. So that's the easiest way to do that. Um, another thing you'll want to do is whatever network you happen to be on or you think you might use in the future, go ahead and put that as a home net. I was actually going to clear open this t this 10.12 because it's pretty common. Um, I use it in adversary emulation tutorials a lot, but just for good practice, we'll leave it closed for now. I don't know if I'm going to use it. So we'll add one just so we can see what that looks like. Um, home net, and then got to put it in the square brackets. My current home net is dot one dot zero slash twenty four. So basically, when you're putting in a whole subnet, in case you're not familiar, you basically just take the first three entries on your um, IP address, put a zero, and then whatever your um, sub mask is, your, sub, your bit mask here. Um, in this case, it's slash 24. Most home networks are going to be slash 24. Um, business networks, you know, they can be on larger subnets, so you never know. Oops, I just put a W in there. Don't want that. External net, I leave it at any, um, and also obviously not home net. So anything other than home net. So the other configuration change that we need to make, um, so far we've changed the names of the sniffing references. We've changed the names of um, the home net. We've added ours. Now what we need to do is you need to scroll pretty far to the bottom, um, pretty far down. And we're going to come, or you could use the um, find um, search function to get here quickly. It's up to you if you want to scroll or do that. Um, if you do want to look for it, um, if you're using nano, then do the control W and it'll take you to where it is, and you can look it up. But here's um, stream. So check some validation. We're going to put this to no. And the reason we're going to do this is because sometimes if you're using a packet capture or other um, method to replay TCP traffic, the checksum's not going to validate properly and you're going to be dropping packets. So instead of trying to validate all the checksums, it's better just to switch this for no, unless for some reason you have um, to activate it in your environment or if that's just a policy. But for now, we're going to go ahead and deactivate it. So that again, that was um, under stream, check validation to no. Okay, we're going to save our changes. And that's the end of our configuration. At this point, we could actually start using Sericata. However, we would be entering it from the command line and it would be a little difficult um, over time to keep that kind of management going. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to create a service file that will then allow us to use, um, you know, the standard service start, status, and stop commands instead of having to, you know, use Sericata and arguments all the time. So what I'm going to do is have us um, write the service document, service file. So sudo nano and then the location that these are stored in is slash lib slash systemmd slash system slash and then Sericata and the extension we're going to add is service. It's going to be blank because obviously there's no service yet. Now I'm referring back to that um, article that I had written on this. Again, we'll make this available so you don't have to type this all in. But I will explain what it means because we want you to learn as well as be able to set it up. Okay, so in the beginning of any service, here we have unit. You give a description 
and um, then after this means you know when can it start so you have the syslog target and the network online target so once the network and syslog targets are on then this service can start this explains the um, environment variables that are going to be used so um, this explains what's going to be done um, before it which is the clearing of the process ID file because we want that to reset every time it's started and then this is the command that's actually going to be used when it starts Notice it has the file path, user bin Suricata tells it where the configuration is, where the process ID file is going to be stored. And then here's a very special part of the command that's especially important, which is the hyphen hyphen AF packet. That's telling it how the interface itself is going to manage the packet capture and inspection. Um, there's different um, methods to this. You can also use um, PF ring, other things like that, but for my experience at first I like AF packet. And then of course um, on the reload it um, kills the service for us. So when you stop the service this is exactly what happens. The kill, whatever user it is, and then the um, process ID. So this is our service file and we save that and now it's added. So the next thing we're going to be doing is installing Zeek. Um, again, Zeek provides some very good parsing of packet metadata including um, things that are very important when understanding exactly what a protocol is doing and what commands might be being sent. So the first thing we got to do is install some dependencies. And we're going to be building this from source, so there's going to be quite a few dependencies. First, we got to make sure that Git is installed. Funny enough, on Ubuntu, it is not by default, so I'm just going to do it. Okay. Okay, we had already installed it on this one, but if it wasn't, that would have done it, so that's nice. Now, I highly suggest that you copy-paste, <laughs> particularly when you're building things from source, because a lot of the times they'll have a lot of dependencies. Let me go into what some of these mean, um, just because it took me a while to figure that out, and I'd like to share that knowledge. Obviously, as you can see, um, CMake, Make, GCC, GC++, those kind of things, um, Flex and Bison. A lot of those have to do with um, C++ compiling and building, libcap development, libssl development, Python dev, um, you know, the different development um, dependencies that are needed to build software that does packet capture, works with Python scripts, things like that. Same here with Swig and um, ZLI BLG dev. I just want to go over that a little bit in that one of the philosophies that the creators and I'm going to go ahead and push in there too so this so I'm talking while it's loading so the creators of Unix which is the predecessor of Linux the, the creators believed that each tool should be as small of a code base as possible so that Unix, Linux um, and such and other um, operating systems like BSWD and things like that they all are very compartmentalized and they're all really lightweight because of that. Notice that just because we want to use various software, we don't have to have all the big packages to do everything. You only need to add them as you need them, like we are. So when you're loading dependencies, it seems like a hassle, but at the same time, it's actually at the core of what's made Unix-based um, operating system so successful. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and git clone the um, Zeek repository 
Very important that you put this hyphen hyphen recursive in here. That way, um, what that does is it makes it so that any folders and directories that may lead to further um, repositories or further file levels are also being um, cloned. Otherwise, you could miss things. Should go fast enough for me to leave the camera on, I believe. So yeah, this is actually something that's good to practice is building from source because there's a couple reasons you might do it. Um, the first reason is sometimes things just aren't offered in a repository, as in the case um, on a lot of OSs with Zeek. There's just not a repository that has Zeek a lot. The other problem is some repositories aren't updated very often. And so they they might have an older version and you might want the newest version. So that the that's actually the case of why we're doing Zeek this way. It's because it's really best practice to have the newest version. And just so you get a handle on this for future projects, these next three commands are actually always going to be the same. And if you can memorize them, you know so much about building from source. And that is configure once you're in the um, source file, obviously. Dot slash configure make and sudo make install. Um, as long as you're using things like cmake and make, this is going to be the classic three, as I call them, of instructions to um, build something from source. So if you get used to it now, it makes life easier. Yeah, so we've already downloaded it. It's cloning into all its wonderful directories. Okay. So we'll clear CD into Zeek, and then the trinity of compiling from source. Oh, forgot the pseudo. That was hilarious. Thank you. So what it's doing right now is it's checking to make sure that you have all of the um, dependencies and that they're where they need to be. If there was an error, um, the best suggestion is to read it very closely because most likely you just forgot to add a dependency. I've been able to make things work where um, maybe an author forgot to mention a dependency or something got changed. And usually if you do enough Googling, you can figure out what you're missing. So then we need make, I don't think that needs sudo, but we'll do it anyways. Okay, so the make part of this is the longest um, section because this is when it's actually compiling everything. So I'm actually going to be turning the camera off because as much as I'd love to talk through the whole thing, none of us really want that. So just sit tight, relax. It'll take a while depending on your RAM size and um, speed of your processor and such. We'll be back right after this finishes. The long process of doing the compiling of Zeek is complete now. So all you have to do to install is sudo make install. And once you enter this command, it will install Zeek and it will be much quicker. And once that's all done, Zeek's ready to be configured. Now that's set up, the next thing we need to do is add Zeek to our path. Now, usually we would do this in the etc environment file, but it's going to need sudo access. And on, Z, on Ubuntu, this needed to be done in a separate place. Um, with secured users. So we're going to put it in the um, sudo section for this. So the command on Ubuntu is sudo v sudo. Now, you can also um, put it in the local content, etc sudoers.d, instead of directly modifying this, which production environment, maybe you have different requirements for operation, you may not want to put it here, so that's always an option, but in this particular setup, I'm just putting it here, since this is a lab IDS for the most part. 
And we're going to enter the path for Zeke is what we're going to be entering. These are separated by colons. So we have the colon, then the path, which is slash USR, slash local, slash Zeke, slash bin. And we save that. Next thing we want to do is go ahead and start. Oh, it doesn't have the command. Start um, modifying the configuration for Zeke. So we're going to do that. And so we're going to sudo nano and then the path to the configuration file, which is here at slash USR slash local slash seek slash ETC. And then it's networks CFG. So here it's, it looks very similar to Sericata. Um, it's asking us what are private IP ranges or IP ranges in general, actually, not necessarily private, that it wants us to monitor. Um, I've actually already put mine in there. So mine's in there already. I leave the others in there just because they're common private IP ranges. And so for the most part, I want them to be considered home nets. And the next thing is we're going to configure the node itself. Now, Zeke is, meant, is um, created so it can work in a cluster. So again, we are configuring. I oh, totally forgot the um, pseudo nano on that. Make sure you're actually using the text editor nano. So the only thing we have to do, because we're not setting up a cluster, is changing the interface name on the sniffer. So that's mine. And as you can see, if you were doing this in a cluster, you would name the host for the manager and then um, the workers. So that's how you would set that up. So you have one managing node and then worker nodes. The next step is to configure Z control, which is the orchestration um, application for Z. It handles things like logging, the intervals of logging, and controls clusters and such. Runs it as a service, everything like that. So we're going to go ahead and nano into this location, which is where the Z control configuration file is. You're going to want to make sure that these mail connections are set to zero. Um, all these mail settings, so these three here, min disk space, mail connection summary, mail host up down. We'll put the log expir expire interval at one day, and then just set stat logs enabled to zero. Um, we're not going to keep any stat logs for this particular IDS. And then for the log directory, um, go ahead and change it. It's not this isn't what it's going to be by default, but change it to slash var slash log slash zeke slash logs. Um, be sure to change that because otherwise. The logs won't be where uh, file beats going to be expecting them. Okay, so make sure you save those changes. Okay. Next thing we have to do is Z control has um, a cron job that it needs to be able to run to do things like rotate logs, um, delete them. Stuff like that. And so what we're going to do here is um, we're going to add that. So we need to enter this crontab hyphen E command. And I'll ask you which one, um, which editor you want to use. I like nano. You don't have to use it, but I suggest it, if, especially if you're a beginner. Okay. And then we're just going to add this to the bottom. It basically just means that it's going to run this every five minutes. Cron jobs are a very useful method of repetitive services on Unix-based machines. You'll want to get used to them. Um, so I suggest you Google cron jobs 
and do some read up on that. But basically, it's actually pretty simple. Um, there's minutes, hours, um, day of the month, month, day of the week. And you can set these things so that they repeat in whatever amount of time you want, what day you want, those kind of things. And then you can just put the command with whatever arguments it needs. Okay, we got that done. All right. Now that we've added the cron job um, for Zeek control, we're going to do one last change to Zeek's configuration, and that is to tell it to log in JSON, because that's what we're going to need it um, to be doing. By nature, it logs in a text tab separated format, and that's not what we want. So we're going to sudo nano this wonderful long path. That's where the local.zeek file is um, placed. So we'll go in here. You'll just want to do this at the bottom of the file. Basically, these are all just different scripts that are automatically loaded when Zeek is deployed. So the one that we're going to be changing it to is the policy tuning for JSON. So just going to do that there and then go ahead and save it. And now it will properly um, output JSON. We just told it that it's going to be logging into um, a file directory that doesn't quite exist yet. So we're going to have to make it. So we're going to cd into var and log. And there's, there's no um, Zeek yet. So we need to make that directory. It would help if I was typing properly. So make directory Zeek. Oh, I forgot to sudo. Make directory Zeek. Then we're going to sudo make directory Zeek slash box. OK. And there you go. Now we have the long directory we need. OK, the next step is going to be to install FileB, which is the agent that will be taking our logs and putting them into Elastic. So the first thing I'm going to do is download their signing key so that we know we have the right software and not some piece of malware. Next thing we do is make sure that we can use that signing key with this particular transport app. It may already be installed, depending if you've used it before. Then we add the repository from Elastic's stable branch. Now we can do a sudo apt update, which will update our repositories that we have. As you can see, Elastic is now in there. And now we can just install FileBeat. FileBeat actually has many modules that can be used. Um, Sericot and Zeek are just some of them. There's also modules for um, Apache server logs. There's modules for different firewall logs. It's quite the adept um, agent. What's really fascinating, though, is Elastic is actually changing the infrastructure for their agents. They now have something called the Elastic Agent, which controls everything, all the beats. But this is currently in beta testing. And so for this video, we've decided to stick with FileBeat since it is still production. The other problem is the Zeek and Sericata uh, modules are actually not um, ready for central management in Fleet yet. So again, um, for this video, I chose to stick with FileBeat. But in the future, um, we'll show you videos how to use Fleet and um, the Elastic Agent once they have um, gotten at least into their next version, most likely, because we want to make sure that they're, they're set and ready to go. OK, so you have options. Um, of how you are running 
your Elastic cluster. Um, you may be running it locally. Um, it may be the same one that you set up in our previous Elastic um, setups in our videos we had. We had one where we set up Elastic with WinLog Beat and we were using the SIM. So, or you may be like me and you may be using Elastic Cloud most of the time, or you might have something that's on your local system. So, what we're going to do instead of showing specific instructions on how to set this up. Instead, I want to um, do a more generalized go through on the file beat, the file beat configuration file. So what we're going to do is do sudo nano then where the configuration file is, is slash etc slash file beat slash file beat dot yaml. So what you have here in file beat is the setups for where your log paths are going to go. Luckily, because we're going to be using the modules for Cercada and Zeek, we're not going to have to touch any of this. Um, this is one of the nice things about the modules. The other you could set up the, um, in fact, actually, I suggest you do set up the host for Kibana, where you're going to be keeping that, where your Kibana host is. If it's on your local, then you can just leave local host. Otherwise, you'll have to put the um, IP address if you're running it. Um, Say from our previous video and you have it set up, then you'll put the IP address of your Elastic Search and Kibana setup on here. Then on the outputs, um, again, you would either leave this as localhost or put the IP address of where you might have that Elastic stack set up right now. Now, if you're using Elastic Cloud, um, you would put the, the URL um, for your Elastic deployment. And if you are using Elastic Cloud or you have secured your Elastic um, setup, then you'll have to put a username and a password as well. So depends on how um, much security you have enabled. And those are the changes to the file beat configuration that you're going to have to make. So the next thing. Once you've um, set up your file beat um, YAML configuration, is we need to enable those modules. So let's do that with sudo file beat. Help if I could spell modules enable Zeek Suricata. And those two are now enabled. Okay, so the final thing that needs to be configured for file B is the Zeek modules um, default path needs to be changed. So you're going to do that at etc file beat modules D and then Zeek YAML. What I need you to do is go to the bottom. Now I've already changed mine, but you'll have to uncomment this and have variable paths and then make sure these brackets are there. And then it's slash var, slash log, slash zeek, slash logs, slash current, and then slash asterisk the wildcard dot log. And that will um, gather the logs as they come when they're brand new. That way, we're not looking for the logs somewhere where they're not going to be found. Okay, and file beat is nice and configured and ready to be used now. Okay, so we configured file beat um, by changing those host parameters. Now, as I mentioned, I'm actually going to be using my stack that's in the Elastic Cloud, which means it's an Elastic cluster that's managed by the company Elastic itself. I just uh, pay a monthly fee to use it and it provides me with a lot of awesomeness that way. So 
one thing that I want to show you is how I configured mine. Um, because this is a very good best practice for when you're configuring um, a beat or another agent that's going to be communicating with Elastic and you want to use a key store. So what I did was I used what's called file beat key store and it stored the uh, passwords and usernames and host and all that. It stored them in environment variables for me but in an encrypted file. So when I write these in I put this format of um, a dollar sign curly bracket and then whatever name I gave to it. I like to prefix mine with ES, so I know it's Elasticsearch. And then I use underscore and then whatever the artifact happens to be. So in this case, it was the host. Um, this is for user and this is for password. Then I close the curly bracket and quote. Don't forget the host still needs to be in the square bracket there. Now, if you're not going to use a key store, um, for instance, if you don't need username and password because you don't have the security enabled on Elastic, then you can just put the um, host IP or host URL, depending on what your setup is, most likely the IP, with the, um, with the port that you are using, which is um, by standard is 9200. Okay. I also put my Kibana host up here as an environment variable that's encrypted. Um, since it is Elastic Cloud, I actually could have done the same setup here by putting my cloud ID and then just providing the cloud authorization passwords here. But just to make our screens look a little more similar, I went ahead and just did it this way so that my hosts are there and my Kibana host is up here. All right, but in yours, um, again, if you don't use the key store because you don't need it, then that's fine. Now, just so you know, um, the commands for the key store, the first thing you have to do is create it. So sudo file be key store create. And then the other commands are going to be... Uh, that's not letting me go through my commands history. sudo file be key store and then add and then whatever the name is going to be. So if I was going to add ES user, then that's how I would do it. Then it will prompt me to give a value. I push enter, it adds it. Um, if it happens to already exist, it'll say do you want to overwrite and you'll say yes. Those instructions are also in the same um, article that I wrote on how to set this all up. So that's how um, you do that. If you've never used FileBeat with this particular stack before, um, if you had been following our previous videos, we only used AuditBeat and WinLogBeat. So this actually wouldn't have been um, set up on this either. So you'll have to do this is sudo FileBeat setup hyphen E and what this does is it um, installs all the index templates, index patterns, dashboards, and visualizations that are default with FileBee. Um, that way it's all set up for you and everything's ready to go. Um, on my particular deployment I've already done it so I'm not going to run it but if this is the first time that you use FileBee in that particular um, elastic cluster then you'll need to do that. We now have everything wonderfully installed and configured. So let's start turning things on. We'll want to do sudo service sericata start. Then we'll want to um, turn on Zeek. Now the first time you turn Zeek on, you're going to use sudo Zeek control and then deploy. Because what this is going to do is this is going to load the configuration, check it for errors, and then start Zeek. Now, as long as you don't change the configuration, the next time you start it, you can just use start. But if you change the configuration or you're unsure if there's errors in it, 
you can push deploy. See, it checked it and now it's ready to go. Okay. And then finally, we want sudo service file b start. And now we've started the model. So now that we have all of our services started, we're going to make sure they're running before making our next move. So this is a very good practice when setting up a new system. So the way you do this is sudo service suricata, and then we're going to do status. Now the interesting thing is we're actually going to see an error status. And it's actually convenient that this occurred because I wanted to discuss this. And the funny thing is, this error was not planned. I had just put an IP address in the YAML file in the wrong place. But instead of fixing it off camera, I decided to show it to you because I wanted to make sure that you saw, one, that this is pretty easy to do with a YAML file, and two, what happens if you miss something on a YAML especially with a YAML file. Okay, so the first thing you'll notice is it just failed right away. Um, it exited with status one failure. Now, the good thing is, is that it's giving an exact line where this occurred in the configuration file. So that's the first good reason to do with status is instead of having to look into the log, it'll show you the last entries. So you can see exactly what went wrong. Now, sometimes if in particular, if it's a YAML configuration file, like FileBeat uses one as well, um, spaces themselves that are invisible to you are not invisible to YAML. Also, when typing out YAML, make sure never to use a tab instead of a space because it doesn't see them as the same thing. Now, conveniently for us, um, we can actually just make this change to the configuration file, and I'll fix it. So, sudo nano and then the location, which is etc, suricata, slash suricata.yaml, come in here. And this was the error. Um, forgot where I was placing this, it doesn't actually want to be put down there. You want it to be in this um, this array here. So this list. So we're going to change that location. OK. Now when we go to start the service and we check its status. It's running. I'll say what version it is. It'll tell you that we don't have rules set up yet, and we'll do that in just one second. And then it will tell us that um, one packet processing threads or management threads initialized. So it's ready to go. Okay, so we're going to turn it off for a sec. Why do I be putting Circana first? Service Circana stop. Since we fixed that error. Now, the next thing we want to do is we need to add Suricata's rules to it so that it can match them. You can actually do this after you install Suricata, or like I'm doing once you confirm that everything's good and working. So they have a function called Suricata Update. And what that does is it loads all the IDS rules that you've configured it to use. In, in this one, we're going to just be using the emerging rule um, rules set. So we're just loading basically um, an, one open source um, source of rules. There are other repositories, and you can go into the Suricata update um, configuration to um, look into that. But this does provide 
a very good rule set out of the box um, and with a very simple command. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start Sericata up again. Why do I keep doing that? Service comes first. Start. Okay, now let's make sure that it's working. And it's good. And now you'll notice that it just clearly states that it's running in system mode and it's version 6.0. All right, so we're going to check the status of Zeek with sudo Zeek control status. As you can see, running gives its um, process ID standalone. Then we're going to do sudo service file beat status, if I can spell status and it's also running and it's showing that our pipelines are starting so now that we've confirmed that they're all running and configured properly we can move to our elastic deployment and start looking at the locks so now we have everything running and we are going to test it uh, the best way to do this is, first of all, make sure everything um, is working. Um, I've actually turned my services off, and I'm going to be turning them back on one by one just to make sure. Second, um, to make sure that the data is moving to Elastic, I'm going to show you where you can download a rather large PCAP, a packet capture, so that you can get some network data in there. So let's go ahead and start. Um, just going to do the... Z control deploy command. Make sure that that starts. Okay, it's going to give the mail error, but that's okay. Because if you want to make sure, double sure, you can always do the status and you'll see that it's running. Okay, and I'm going to do the pseudo service Saracana start. Now, if you left yours running, um, you don't have to do this. I'm just doing it because I turned them off to double check something. Okay, so my Sericata is running. It's all good. Finally, I'm going to turn my file beat on again. Now, you can actually set these so they turn on at boot. Um, it's the same sudo service, and then it would be file beat enable for that one, and um, same thing for Sericata, and then Zeek Control has its own Zeek Control um, enable as well. I don't do that some usually with my lab machines, just because I like to have a little more custom control. But in a production environment, or if you're just you know if you have a dedicated device, then you know you can do that. And it says the harvesters are good. Connection's good. Okay, so everything's running. Happy dance. All right, so I'm going back to here. Um, the, we'll make sure again that this document's there for you. So we're gonna be downloading a um, application called sudo, I mean, sorry, the, that's where the command starts. The application is TCP replay. It replays um, packet captures. There's other features too, but I particularly like its uh, replay features. So just a good old app to install for this guy. Downloads it, sets it up. Okay. Now, I like having these um, packet PCAP samples, especially when they're larger and they have a lot of data to look at. In case you don't have, you know, the ability to tap your own traffic or set up a lab environment right away, you can still do a test. So look online. They have all sorts of different PCAPs. Some of them are just general. Some of them you can get actual um, malware traffic PCAPs so you can start seeing what bad stuff looks like. Things like that. It's a lot of fun. You know, different activities that you can extend your use of the IDS with. Okay, so that's going to download. Um, it's not a huge file, but it is going to take a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and pause. I'm going to pause the um, video while it downloads, and I'll be right back. 
Okay, so I downloaded the Big Flows PCAP and I'm set to now use TCP replay to replay it over my um, interface. So let me go ahead and paste the command in there. Okay, so I'm going to go over the command bit by bit. Um, sudo TCP replay hyphen T tells it to go as fast as it can um, and playing it over the interface. I've noticed that this does a better job um, in um, making sure that everything um, gets recorded by the interface and such. So hyphen T is a good one to use. Hyphen V um, gives you verbose on the screen. Um, I personally like this because it lets me know that it's working. It also gives me an idea of what IP ranges I should be looking at when I'm in Kibana. And then of course hyphen I um, refers to your sniffing interface. This happens to be the one that's mine. Make sure that when you enter yours that it's the one you wrote down from earlier. And then the name of the file which is Big Flow's PCAP. Okay, so I'm going to push enter and it's going to do that. And you can see all that wonderful network traffic um, going in there. It's pretty fun. See if you can catch it. You know, the, 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 the send packets, the Synax, the Axe for all the, you know, handshakes and all sorts of fun stuff going on. Just notice that you can kind of see what some of the IP addresses are going to be. You're going to want to look out for that 172.16 um, in Kibana because that's how you're going to know that it got in. Um, you always want to make sure to do that you know, actually know what's going on. It's a rather big PCAP, so just let it run. Um, it's actually going to start ingesting right away into uh, Kibana, but it's, you know, it's a good idea to let the whole thing run, I guess. You can always run it twice. Um, sometimes PCAPs will drop packets, uh, especially if it's a smaller sample. So sometimes you'll run it twice. There's actually a command for TCP replay to loop. So look at that in the official TCP document. TCP replay documentation, how to loop smaller samples um, to make sure you don't have packet loss. Okay, so next we'll be looking at what this looks like in Kibana. Okay, so I pivoted over to Kibana. Um, again, mine is using Elastic Cloud, so it might look a little different from a local install, but it's pretty much all the same except a few nice little goodies. Um, just want to point this out that Elastic Cloud Service is wonderful because it's at the basic use um, you get a nice um, preview of some of the more advanced topics like machine learning and um, Kibana Graph. I use those quite a bit when I'm doing alerting or if I'm doing threat intelligence work. So it's a it's a big benefit that you get those without having to um, necessarily upfront pay the price of a um, you know full license that you would with say an on-prem um, XBAC license. It comes out cheaper in the end, and you don't have to run the stack yourself. So what I'm going to do to make sure that the data is in there is I'm going to go to discover and I have my file beat index pattern. If you don't have this index pattern already in there, it means that you didn't set up file beat with the um, patterns and everything. So what you're going to want to do is um, you're going to want to do the sudo file beat setup hyphen E command if you don't see this um, particular index pattern because that means something went wrong there. Um, there's another way of checking this actually and I'll show it to you just so that I'm very thorough. Um, you can also go to stack management and you can go to index management and then filter on file beat. And um, you can see that I have I have um, various um, file beat indices that are being added to. So that also tells me that file beat is set up. Um, so that's good. So what we're going to do is go back to discover. And I'm setting this to the last five minutes. Um, I actually monitor my, uh, my um, what do you call it, home system using the Elastic Endpoint Security since it's now free. So I'm going to limit the data to what we just put in using TCP replay by restricting the time period. I shut down the um, endpoint just so I could show you this one. Okay, so we can go to event module here and as you can see we have Suricata and Zeek. Um, it's not the most interesting traffic but it does test it. It does show that we have Zeek and Suricata. 
the next place for you to go and play with the data and it's going to give you the most joy is down here in security go to network and then again I'm going to limit it because this is going to show um, pretty much everything I've been doing over the last um, 24 hours it's kind of neat you can put enterprise grade um, endpoint security on your home system um, for free so again um, we can see the data here now it's pretty much um, showing everything we've been doing let me load last 30 minutes it seems to have been a while there we go there's all the data that we just put in um, there's no way my system did this many network events on its own and then we can see the IP ranges that we saw when we ran the PCAP okay so that went well and it's working um, again expansion of this pro project would be to find other PCAP sources and you can play with them um, the other thing you can do is you could set up what is known as a monitoring port or mirror port or span port on a managed switch and you could actually um, you know intercept your own network traffic or if you set up a virtual lab of course you can set it up um, just on the virtual network you know using virtual box or hyper-v or something like that okay this is Ivan Ninichuk signing off. Um, please remember to like and subscribe on this video if you enjoy our trainings. And thanks again for SkillsBuilds trainings.